the Organic Eccentric, a show dedicated to topics in organic land care. Today's show is about poison ivy, specifically removing it safely and organically. We're at lovely Wolf Park in Monroe, Connecticut. Over my shoulder you can see Great Hollow Lake. And today we have a, an expert in poison ivy removal, Cindy Campbell, owner of The Gloved Hand, a business that specializes in removing poison ivy organically. But before we meet her, I want to tell you some why I'm doing a show on poison ivy. I feel like I've always had a love-fear relationship with poison ivy because of experiences I had as a kid. And one that was the most memorable was when I was about 12 and I had just mowed the lawn at my grandparents' home in Milton, Massachusetts. And at the end, I removed some vines from the bushes along the fence line. And when I got home, I told my mother, I think it might have been poison ivy, I'm not sure. And she immediately threw me into the shower and said, oh, you got to wash that stuff off. Which um, was not bad advice. However, instead of washing it off, I actually spread it onto my face, torso, groin, legs, arms. So that the next day when I woke up, I was a mess and we immediately went off to the emergency room. So that and other experiences really... Uh, put poison ivy in a central place in my life. Now, that hate-fear relationship has changed over time, and that's due to two reasons. One is, I read a very influential book which I have here, and that is Doug Tallamy's Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants. Doug Tallamy is an entomologist at the University of Delaware, and he wrote this book telling us about how important native plants are and even though you don't hear anything in here about poison ivy, he does make the case that they do provide uh, tremendous benefits to the landscape. And therefore, poison ivy has to be included in that. The second thing was I joined the Northeast Organic Farming Association and I took their organic land care course. And the central or cardinal rule of organic land care is do no harm. Now you know that the conventional approach to poison ivy management is you run to the big box store, you get your weed killer and you douse whatever the poison ivy or anything else that you're trying to get rid of. Well that's one approach to go but we're today we're talking about an organic approach. Now, All right here we are with Cindy Campbell the owner of The Gloved Hand, the business that specializes in organic poison ivy removal. Cindy, thanks for being on the show today. Oh you're welcome Franny. Yes. My pleasure. And I have I have a number of questions before we actually get into poison ivy identification, removal, all those kinds of things. So it's great. How on earth did you get involved in removing poison ivy? Oh, because it was on the property of the house we bought. So my husband was really allergic to it, so I got the job. Oh, well that's great. Yeah. So once I did my property, my neighbor saw it and she asked me to do her property and then her daughter's property because the grandchildren were getting it from catching balls, throwing balls into the woods. She said, please take care of my, my grandchildren. And so my parents started hiring me. You know, it just started to grow. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been doing it? Probably 20 years and we bought the house. In the oh, 80, really? In it's been that long? Oh, more. Yeah, we bought it in 88, so that's a long time ago. Right, that's great. Now, why get involved in something that seems so dangerous to the rest of us? Probably the same reason I did it for my husband. It needs to be done, it, and somebody who can handle it more safely than he can, for instance, it's the logical conclusion. Mm. And so, And then it was so appreciative. I love doing something that people really think I'm great, <laughs> think that I did a great job and did something great for them, and they just can't do anything but say thank you. Mm -hmm. And I like that. I like yeah. positive reinforcement. Now, for our audience, 
What should people do when they find poison ivy in their environment, their landscape? How should they react? Well, you can mark it. That's usually a good, safe start. Put a big rock, a stick, um, something so you remember that it's there, so you don't run into it and expose yourself. Um, and then you can dig it out. You really can. Um, you have to protect yourself, as you'll see in this video. And digging it out by the roots gets it completely extracted from your property. So that's my estimation that is the most effective. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had any uh, singular experiences in removing poison ivy that really stand out for you? A patch so big, a patch so difficult? Yeah, sure. Um, there was a huge clump on a picket fence, so it's right around the post of the picket fence. Mm -hmm. And Oh, not a picket, but a, a split rail. So it's around the post, and it has grown and grown and grown, and it's gone up on the top of the post, and it's spread along the, pick, the rail. And at that um, one post, it was so entrenched that we dug out a hole about this big around. Mm -hmm. And I'm down in there getting under the roots so I can get every last root, finally pulling it up and holding it in my hands. <laughs> and uh, uh -oh. I was, it was a very hot day in the 90s, and I was wearing silk to keep myself cool, silk shirt. And when the next couple of days I came down with a rash on my two forearms, it wasn't the intense bubble rash, it was more like a smoother, um, just a redness that was itchy, because it was again through the shirt. Mm -hmm. But um, that was the one time when I had to use an over the counter medication to treat the skin. Mm. Which is something we want, we're going to talk about yes. in the show what, what you need to do. Yes. Mm -hmm. Kind of out of left field. Have you ever had dreams about poison ivy? <laughs> I didn't know you'd ask that. Yeah. <laughs> I only had one. Really? Yeah. I mean, besides dreams, I, in the beginning, I'd be spending three hours looking at the leaf, looking for the leaf, you know, seeing it in the midst of everything else. Mm -hmm. And I'd close my eyes at night and see the poison ivy leaf on my eyelids. On your eyelids? Yeah, just, I you can... know, the visual, the outline oh, of I it see. and everything. Right. Um, and, but then during that time I did have one dream mm. and uh, it was that the poison ivy, uh, the essence of it, the, the, what it's generated from, you know, it was saying that it didn't intend to be harmful to humans. Interesting. And it, it's not that it said, you know, I'm sorry or anything like that. It just mm. said, we didn't want to be a problem. Mm. And, and that was kind of a, a response to my intense focus on the plant and working with it and not being antagonistic or afraid of it, but just getting to know it. I think that it just gave me that as a response in my own dream. Let's start to look at poison ivy to distinguish its features. This is a black birch. Looks fine. Underneath one of its branches is poison ivy. Poison ivy likes a little bit of shade. So it is very healthy right here. The leaves are green, big, and some of them are shiny. I don't know if you can tell. The shininess is here, but down here, they're not that shiny. I'm not sure if that means these are older or newer leaves. Probably the older leaves are not shiny. The newer ones are, because that's how they are in the spring. But this, these are not shiny, but the one right next to it is. And these are shiny. Now, the leaf itself, the identifier here, I'm going to rip off the piece. The middle leaf has a stem, its own stem, and that is one of the identifiers of poison ivy that makes it distinctly different from other plants that have three leaves. You'll see the strawberry leaf 
this middle leaf is growing right out from here. Um, there are the trillium plant, which is a three-leaf uh, spring flower. All three leaves come out from the same place. So that is a distinguishing feature. Now on this, it's such a big leaf that the stem is obvious and clear. In some cases, you might have to take a stick you don't have your protective gloves on, you're out trying to identify in the woods, you might have to move it around a bit and manipulate it to see if you can tell is there a stem for that middle leaf or not. I want to show you some leaves that are new baby ones. So we're going to look closely at these little tiny ones. They've got that redness and in the spring they really show up as red. Not as much this time of year, but you will see this color in it. When it transitions from the bright red in the spring, it gets this um, mottled look of sort of reddish green as it transitions into being a solid green leaf. This is a nice little patch. It's getting some sun, but not all day, so it has some shade as well. And these leaves are interesting. The, um, let me pluck one of these out. This is the middle leaf, and it's got some damage to it. These are the two side leaves that have the notches. And the notches are typically away from the middle leaf. So if I showed you a healthier leaf. The bigger notches are on the outside of the set of three, and the, uh, the inside of those two leaves have small notches in this leaf specimen, but they're not big notches. And there's more than one, and there's a few little, even tiny ones right at the end. But the majority of the notches are on the two outside bottom leaves that are opposite each other. The one that has the long stem coming off is the middle leaf, and it often has notches as well, but they're not normally as big as the ones on this leaf. And sometimes this middle leaf doesn't have any notches at all. Occasionally these leaves are fairly smooth and you can just see a very subtle indentation. Um, but this is very typical of poison ivy leaf. And if you notice, um, actually let me show you two again. So you're seeing these notches, they're typical. These are a little bit more developed. Look at this, pointing out right there. And these are very uh, extreme notches. So you have variations to the leaf, and it goes on and on um, from very few to no notches to a lot of notches. So we can look at um, the variation on the colors of these two sets of leaves. This particular set of three leaves is very pale. Look at the contrast between this set of leaves and this set. On the same plant, these are the newer leaves, the very light pale ones, and in the spring they're bright red when they first come out, but they can go through a pale stage in the summer when they, I don't know, they're not getting probably as many nutrients, but the green leaves is more typical, but in combination you will see some of the lighter ones with the darker ones as the leaf grows throughout the summer. The plant is always producing leaves throughout the summer and uh, that's how you'll see it in the middle of July and August. It's right through this plant right here and the darker ones down here on the ground. That's a pretty distinctly dark green Sometimes that color pops out at me when I'm walking along because it is so dark and there aren't that many leaves that get quite as green as a poison ivy leaf with the similar three leaf shape. I mean you have other dark green leaves but not in this um, shape and the growth vicinity where these plants grow. This is kind of a cute little patch, nice all small leaves. Um, not, doesn't really, isn't doing too much, climbing the rock a little bit, growing some more baby leaves. This was probably cut sometime this year and it's now grown back, so that's why they're all small. But you have a lot of variations in color, light green and dark green. Now this little bud, 
I think it as the start of a curly cue or the baby toenail of a deer, you know, it just has a curve to it. As if a pinky toenail that gets bent out of shape. And there is no other bud quite like it. This it gets this auburn brown color to it. And the Virginia Creeper, which is the most closely matched look-alike, has a symmetrical bud that goes straight out the end of the vine. So in the winter, when there are no leaves, no stems on these vines, Virginia Creeper and Poison Ivy alike, you can look at the vine itself and identify which one it is by the bud. There are other aspects of Virginia Creeper that are different which we'll show you on a Virginia creeper branch, but this is what we'll be looking at, is the nodes. Right here is a node, and there's a few nodes up here, and there's a node, and these have potentially can grow a leaf or a root, and both sometimes, and here's a node here. And what you'll notice on the Virginia creeper is the node is symmetrically showing itself on all sides, I believe, and it's big and it's more like a bead, you know, a, a, a squarish shaped bead that has a hole through it so you can string it. It has that more of a blocky shape to it, to the Virginia Creeper nodes. And we'll, we'll go look at some vines in the woods now. Well, here we are in a small forest of poison ivy climbing vines that are on many of these trees. There's one there next to it. There's a few over there. And just about everywhere I point, there's a thick, hairy vine climbing a tree. And on the tree right here next to me, I've got a hairy vine. And we're going to look at the base of it a little bit. And I have a theory about all these hairs. Why so many hairs, I said to myself one day. And I thought, it's looking for soil. Right? That's what the obvious thing it's doing. And every hair that gets produced doesn't find soil, and so it produces another one right next to it in hopes that maybe a couple centimeters away there will be soil. So it keeps do doing the search for soil. And every, that's my theory. And every hairy vine that hits the bark searches inside the bark and manages to get a really good grip on the tree itself. This is a thick one. I don't think I'm going to be able to budge it with a good sharp tool. It's just too there. Moved a little bit. Did you see that? Did you see that? Okay. So that's where I. Aha! It's starting to pull away more. The bark of the tr this tree is a little weak, so it's pulling some of the bark off with it. Um, these get a little tougher to pull down. You can leave it on the tree. Just cut it and leave the rest to die, the stuff below the cut is going to still be, and it will still produce lots of poison ivy leaves. If you leave it on the tree, who knows when this root will no longer have any urush oil that will contaminate a human. The Yuru soil is right under the bark, so you get the hairy stuff off, and then there's a bark. And underneath there is the Yuru soil, right under the bark. So how long will it take for the bark to decay in order to allow the oil to air dry? And in New England, where we are, it's very humid, so it could take several years. Down at the base of this tree is where it originally came from, the, the thicker of the two. But it has an offshoot going in another direction. This big side, the side that's the original, is very thick. And it's producing all the leaves that are growing around here, most likely. And every one of these trees in this forest that has a poison ivy climbing vine has a base of a root bed that is producing leaves. So basically walking through here, you've got exposure to poison ivy on your boots or shoes continually through here. It would be very hard to walk through here. 
We have a climbing vine on the other side of this tree that's thick and hairy, but it's wrapping around and it's coming over here. I wanted to show you some of the branches that come off the climbing vines um, that produce poison ivy leaves. I feel like it's touching my hair. This one happens to be broken right up there, which is the only reason why it's bending down far enough for me to reach it. But here's another one, and it doesn't have any leaves on it right now. Here's one that is part of what I'm holding on to. It has leaves. And as you go up the story of the tree, these leaves are on small branches of their own. That's poison ivy branches. At the very top is the pine tree. So they, the poison ivy can climb up, grow like a bush, can overtake a tree. You think the tree is still alive. The tree is, could be at one point dead. It's so infested with poison ivy. And these branches are coming out, taking in all the chlorophyll they need, and just growing very happily on a tree. This is an oak tree and it's several years old, perhaps to get to be this tall, maybe just a few years or one. Um, but the leaves, when they're down low to the ground, they are tiny, similar to poison ivy. But the difference is that these three leaves are all coming out from the same spot, not like poison ivy, that the middle leaf would be coming out with a longer stem. It's not like I don't wear those boots. These all have the equal length stem, all three leaves. And yet here's poison ivy right near it. Right next to it we have several trilliums here. These three leaves here, again, are not... This one is not coming out with a long stem, so this is a trillium. We have some Virginia creeper right over here. The famous look-alike for poison ivy. The nodes, oh, I'll show you the leaves too, so we all know it's Virginia creeper. The nodes, as, as I was talking about earlier, more bead-shaped, um, thicker than poison ivy nodes. These down here are tubers, which happens in poison ivy also. The tuber fills up with stored energy when it needs to survive by doing that. Now right next to this Virginia Keeper was some po the poison ivy branch that we were looking at. And I want to look at the nodes so you can see the difference. So here's the Virginia creeper node, and here are some poison ivy nodes. I'm gonna find some brown ones. They're not big at all. They don't bulge out. They're not bead shaped like these here. This one's a little bit bead shaped. There's a more th a thickness right there and right there. And this poison ivy one has a node here. But it's not all the way around. The plant is coming out one side. The Virginia creeper is pretty much a node all the way around the vine. So in the winter, the fall, early spring before the leaves come out, you can tell poison ivy versus Virginia creeper by these um, more diminished profile in their nodes and also by those buds that we looked at earlier. There aren't a lot of buds this time of year, so it's hard to find too many examples of those. So here's something else where I'm gonna call bramble. And the leaves are three, and they look like poison ivy in a way. They're, um, they've got the longer stem for the middle leaf. There's some sawtooth here, but there's some notches, plus too many sawtooths for poison ivy and there is 
sawtooth on the upper side as well of this leaf and there's just a lot of sawtooth around here but really distinct on this vine you can see the thorns so this vine is going to produce a berry most likely and poison ivy never has a thorn on it it's missing its paired leaf right here but you'll see it over here there's one leaf two on the side and then two more so this is not poison ivy even though you may see the first three leaves and think gee it looks a lot like poison ivy it's got the long middle vine the edges aren't quite defined you can't tell exactly what the notches are not distinct so it doesn't really have notches but it looks like poison ivy there just follow the vine down and check it out and you'll see on this lower one it's got the three and then the two so that's five Now we're going to look at organic eradication of poison ivy. I picked out a tree trunk because um, poison ivy often is at the base of a tree and it's a complicated situation because of the roots of the tree itself. And here's a nice big tree root which is um, going to have poison ivy somewhere around it and it's a process of discovery. Get rid of the non-poison ivy and we'll I hold a leaf, try to find the last leaf in the line, because the last one, there it is, allows me to have something to pull. And I'm very gently pulling because I, there ends up being just hairy roots right here, very small. And now I'm getting a gentle pull and it's not coming up, so I know there's something more substantial. Just a little bit more hairy roots dug in. Now it's crossing another poison ivy vine, this one, or it's joining it. So I'm going to go backtrack and find the beginning of this one, which is underneath a root of something else. I don't think this is a poison ivy root, but the vine itself is going under this. And here's the top, so I will just slide it out from under that one. And there we have the two ends. Now I have more access freedom of, of digging around it without cutting into any of the poison ivy. And there's a root right here. I can see it. I can feel it with my fingers pull on it. And that tells me just where it is. And I pulled it up. It's very effective to little clearing of the area because the vine is low, um, very shallowly buried in the dirt. It's, but it's good to get the surface stuff out of the way so you can see which direction it's going and what's going on. Now I'm running my left hand along the vine because I want to find where there's a root going into the ground without breaking it. Now this one is so tiny you can't even see it probably. It's a hairy root. Hairy roots, I don't believe, have enough energy stored in them uh, by themselves to grow um, another vine all on their own. So I don't worry about the small ones. I figure the size of poison ivy vine, that if I broke it, like if it was going into the ground, it was a root, and it was as thick as this runner, then I would dig it all out because I'm, this is the typical size of poison ivy, so I'm assuming that it has typically enough energy to survive in the ground because it has soil, water, and a little bit of energy in it. It's probably got enough to grow. So I try to get anything out that's the thickness of a typical runner or larger. Sometimes I err on the side of caution and get out ones that are a little thinner than this one. nice that so far we've avoided having to dig deep right around this root because it's so big. It would have been a challenge to get the ivy out.
I'm not sure which direction this is going right here. Maybe down. Maybe it's got a fork in a couple directions. There's leaves here, there's leaves here. So I can't quite get to it. I'm going to follow along here. Ah, nice and loose. I like that. Now I can get to it from this side. Oh, there's another vine right here. Let's just get it out of the way also. Go down to the end where it's going to be a little looser. When I'm in the middle of the vine, it's tight here, it's tight there. I, it gives me less freedom to access the root that I want to get out. So I'm going to follow up a little bit. Heading towards the tree, danger zone. Ah, but it's just going up the tree, very gentle. And right here we have a, a stubborn root. It's thick. It's got four. It's going in four directions. Right here, there's a junction, and the junction is. A little bit thick, full of energy stored like a tuber. And some of the vines, the one of them is, is a little bit thicker. Two of them are thicker than the typical runner size. So these are a little bit more established. I'm getting closer to where the source of this particular vine probably is. And it's going to be the most entrenched spot. And this is where we might get into some complications with the tree itself. like I'm an archaeologist on a dig, just dusting off the vines so I can see what it's doing, which direction it's going. I don't want to be just wildly digging in there and cutting a vine, sometimes not even knowing it. So I always want to know where the vine is going before I dig, so I clean it off a little bit. that way. I can feel it with this pointer finger here. It's going up this way. And these are skinny guys. They may not be viable by themselves. But this one is thicker. This one is thicker than any of the typical runners with. So uh, we probably have a tuber here where it's been ripped in the past. Once they're thicker, they go down deeper, they're harder to remove. There we go. Now, it broke a little bit, but it's also ripped, so I believe it uh, was weak in this dirt anyways. This is not very rich soil for growth. Get a couple stones out. And because 
I ripped it down right there, I'm just going to tap the air out of the dirt. Put a little bit of dirt in there, tap it down again. So this is if if there is something there that's viable, I'm trying to take its air source away so it will have a more difficult time growing. There we take the little runner off there and we've got that end loose, which is good. here too. Wow, we got the whole piece out. Alright, we'll make a little pile just for his ivy to bag it up later. There's other roots going by and you can't always tell that they're actually attached to the poison ivy and are poison ivy themselves. They may not be, uh, but this one is. It's got a poison ivy leaf. Here it is. So there's five. if we can just use a stand-up shovel. If I don't have any more in us coming out on this side, I can probably use a shovel. I don't like to just go shallow and lift up too much. I like to get down as far as I can, straight down. And I might wiggle it back and forth a little bit to get the ground looser. I don't want to rip the poison ivy root that's way down there. So we'll loosen up all the dirt that's on the shovel there and pull it out. bit better where this root is going, what direction it's traveling. Oh, it's big. It's a good size. This has been cut many times. Going this way keeps me from breaking the root or loosening some of the dirt. get broken but it's a skinny thing skinnier than the typical runner so that's good and the whole piece looks like it's coming out now and I'd like to show you what it does when it's been cut. It was cut right here at this top here. That was the original vine that ran out from that little knob and it was alive and well. And then it got cut and so these grew. Well, the first thing that happened is the energy is coming up from the ground doing this typical thing of running through the root and expecting to run all the way to the very tip of the runner where there's a new leaf growing and it stops right here because it can't go any farther once it's cut. So if it's all stopped here the energy doesn't know it at first it's coming and coming and it, it just builds this tuber full of stored energy for new growth in the future and this is what it decided to do grow all these out and in addition the tuber, you know, extended, it got big, and it decided to put out a few more roots as well. Because what else does it have to do with its energy but grow leaves and grow roots? So it's doing both. And these roots are a little thicker than the normal root. And in some tubers, these roots go down as a tap root. Now the direction this was laying, I don't, I think it was more like this, I don't see any tap roots, but sometimes it goes straight down from off the tuber somewhere, and it can go down two feet. I've actually dug a two foot hole and measured it, and I was amazed that it had a tap root, that poison ivy could possibly do tap roots. 
but poison ivy adapts to whatever circumstances it's in. And if it's been cut, that's its new circumstance and it deals with it. Why do we need to prepare before we go out and remove poison ivy? Well, the first thing uh, I want to do is set up for when I'm done with the poison ivy job because I'll be contaminated and I won't be able to do anything. Uh, so all the preparation that I do now, a lot of it will be for that point at the end of the job. One of the first things that I always try to remember is to get a bag ready for putting my clothes into. And this was the first bag I ever started to use when I worked with Poison Ivy, and I've now extended the concept to a lot of other items here. But the first problem I had to solve was how do I get back into my house, get the clothes into the laundry and not contaminate anything. I realized that I needed some container that would stay open so that I could just slide the clothes right in without um, touching the outside of the bag and contaminating anything, so I folded down the outside of a grocery bag, which can be challenging and sometimes it rips the entire bag and you have to start over. But this gives me a nice rectangular opening. When I put it on the ground, it stays open. One of the things I use for um, the clothing bag is a grocery bag, and you'll see at the end, I wrap it up, tie it off, and it's very easy to throw in the back of my car, take back to the washing machine, and, um, and dump it into the washer. So this is the bag set up for the clothes. That's the first thing to remember to do. Now the other aspect of poison ivy work is that you have to think. You have to stop and think about what you're going to do, what's the next step, did you miss anything because poison ivy is invisible, the urushiol oil is invisible, so it has to be something where you're watching what you're doing from uh, an objective standpoint and you know what's going on. One thing I would like to show you are these um, knee pads. They have glue on them so they stick to the knee pad. The one location where I will be getting exposure is through my knee, through my clothes at my knees. So these particular pants have a set of these knee pads on them and they stick and after a couple washings they started to peel off so I put them on my sewing machine and stitched the edges and now they're going to stay there and confident for the long haul. And uh, I have these available for customers who I train. They can put them on their pants. You can also wear a second layer of pants if it's a cool October day. You can wear just capris um, to cover the knee area, or you can use ivy black. My favorite preferred, um, uh, uh, what would you call it? My preferred method for protecting myself when I need extra protection. If I have um, a thin sleeve shirt, like a silk shirt on because it's so hot, I'll put this all over my forearms. And if I have a pair of pants without a knee pad and nothing underneath the pants, I will cover my knees with ivy block. It's a preventative. It, it stops the urushiol, urushiol from being able to be active on my personal skin, my body oils, so they don't blend. I also have... Um, a container of wipes and it's the same thing as the isopropyl alcohol. I took the label off so I could clearly see my writing that it's a clean and clear of oil. This is not a baby wipe in the baby diaper aisle that has aloe on it. This is in the first aid aisle near the band-aids and a lot of stores actually don't sell isopropyl alcohol in the wipes form so you have to hunt around just there's a few stores that do. The sleeves of a shirt, I um, have found that when I bend my elbows and I'm weeding, my sleeves get pulled out of my gloves. So, 
I'll try to get sleeves that are down to the base of my fingertips. And these are actually a little short today because when I pull up, they, they don't go to the base of my fingertips. But I'm going to make sure I start with them right there when I put my gloves on, my first layer of gloves. And they are nitro gloves. Blow them up, open a little bit to get them easier. So what I've done is just put two fingers in to get the glove in its general place and the three fingers are holding the shirt. Then I can bring that um, glove around the fist basically, it's a small fist. And I can even put the rubber band on at this point. extra precaution that I started early on before my sleeves were as long as they are now and I find that it's still useful sometimes to keep that glove and that sleeve intact the way I want them. And then I take the last three fingers and slide them in. Then the glove is on fairly deep and my original sleeve is still up here. And I'm going to put my boots on. Again, these bags, it's the same cuffing process. I don't want to slide my boots out and possibly contaminate the outside of the bag more than it might already be. So I use my hands to cuff only touching the outside. So I don't like put my hands in the cuff and try and turn it around. I always use my hands from the outside of the bag in this beginning stage. Check to see which that's my left foot. But I keep my uh, pants outside of my boots because I found too much dirt was going down the inside of my boots over time. So my pants slide on the outside. All right, so the last pair of gloves. I'll put a little powder on my latex gloves because it just makes it easier to get these gloves on. Mostly on the fingers. Any contamination these blue gloves have, now I've got these washed gloves. Now I am confident, I'm absolutely contaminant free, I can touch anything I want with these until I start working and touching my tools. So I think that we're done for this stage of the game. Right, now we're at the very important process of cleanup and disrobing. We don't want to get anyone contaminated, the least of all ourselves, but we also don't want to pass the oil to some object that then someone else touches. So a stick is very handy to, as a tool to do things with when your glove is covered with urushiol. So I'm going to use it to open my trunk. And then I have to remember that this is the contaminated end. If I need to use it again, that's the end I want to touch. This is a bag that I use to blunt the sharp edge of this shovel because I have to store my shovel in a bag in my trunk. But you can just use it for poison ivy and then wash it really good with a garden hose. It seems to push the oil off metal hard surfaces that are non-porous. And the um, you can also just leave the shovel on the driveway and let it rain, let the rain pour on it, and then go out, flip it over, and let the rain pour on the other side. And I've done that many a times when the first thing I was doing was my own yard. I left my boots out in the rain, and then I'd go flip them over, and I left all my tools out in the rain and would flip them over. And now I can take my gloves off, and I slide them off equally so the two gloves come off at the same pace and at the same time so 
so that I can use the, each glove to work on the other one. When they're both ready to drop, I let them go. And these gloves are fairly clean. I did touch some the outside of some bags earlier today with these gloves, so I wouldn't trust these to be 100% clean. But they're um, going to be adequate to do a number of things that I need to do. And I want to start with maybe the least contaminated thing, so that these gloves build up to being the most contaminated that they're going to get. And the first thing I want to do is get the next most contaminated thing off of me, the pants, the sleeves, my boots. These are my boot bags. Handling them on the outside. I put my hands up inside the cuff so I don't even touch the cuff. boot is now safely protected in the bag. And these sleeves are fairly contaminated. I need to take the rubber bands off so that I can work on my sleeves easily. I'm also going to work right at my waist. There's probably not a lot of oil, so I'm not really contaminating my gloves at this point. I wear shorts underneath my pants so I can do this outside in decency. And I can put my hands right on the top of my boot, but I'm touching my boot through the inside of my pants, which are oil free. I'm going to do that with the other boot. I can touch these pants from the inside, put my arms down the pant legs like their sleeves, just so I can grab the pant leg. Ball it up because I don't I want to leave these pants turned outside, the right side out, because that will clean the most oil in the washing machine. The next is my shirt. And I'm going to also remove my socks just in case anything got in there. So these sleeves from here up are contaminant free. So I can comfortably grab them, run them, pull them up over my skin and not worry about any oil coming off from the inside of these gloves. And that's how I can get the shirt off. This shirt's been tucked in my pants, so the very bottom of the shirt doesn't have any oil on it whatsoever. Let's get the bandana off. I guess I'm going to be, I didn't touch much with my bandana anyway. And we're done. Got the shirt, and we'll make sure the outside of the sleeves stay on the outside. Don't get turned inside out. You can even push it down because I'm on the inside of the shirt, so I can push and manipulate things in there. And that bag will be ready to pack up. And my gloves are now ready to just touch outsides of these bags. And this is where I can do the cuff. I fold the cuff back up, and I do it from the outside of the bag, so I'm not touching the inside of the coffee. Right, it's always important to know what do you do despite all that clothing you've put on that you showed us earlier. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you still get some on you. Mm -hmm. Cindy, what do you do once you feel like you've been contaminated in some way? Well, I've got a couple remedies here with me. And these are remedies people can find easily? Well, the, once the rash has already taken place, 
Mm -hmm. um, I'll use homeopathy. These are Rus toxicodendron, the Latin name for the poison ivy plant. And they come in different strengths. You can get them at the health food store. Mm -hmm. So these are really helpful. They take the itch right away. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I take it orally. You don't even have to um, worry about this. It'll stop itching in a couple minutes. Oh, wow, great. Now, what about when I'm in the field and I know I got like a brush of a leaf on my face or something like that, which happened recently. I had a, a twig that was cut and it hit my chin. Well, I went out and I have this, um, this is isopropyl alcohol, and I took the label off so that the identification label is still here, but the main label off, mm -hmm. so I could make it really obvious that this is a clean and free of oil, Urushio, um, because I have two of these, one that's completely contaminated in the field. So when I got this on my chin, mm -hmm. I took my contaminated jug, which I always have handy, when I'm working in poison ivy, and I um, try not to contaminate with my gloves. I've got my poison ivy gloves on, and I try to reach through and just touch the end of this and pull it out and use it um, to rub down the spot. Mm -hmm. and, and can I just show folks that it says clean and free of oil, so you've really marked that up so that yeah. people will know, I don't or wanna, that you'll know. Yeah, I don't want to forget. Uh, you know, I need everything to really self-direct me all the time because it's an invisible thing. Right. Oh, excellent. Um, so I, when I grabbed the thing, I noticed that it was open just a little bit. So I thought, oh, it's going to be dried out a little bit. So I do have um, also a contaminated jug of this and a clean jug, again, clean. And I can pour a little bit on it if it's dried out, and I can also use this to fill up a spray bottle so I can have isopropyl alcohol handy. I can get a little bit of a, a higher dosage, you know, a lot more alcohol on me and then follow up with a wipe and rub it spray, off. Spray then wipe. Yeah. If it's on the face, you can spray the wipe and get extra spray on the wipe. Okay. Um, and I also have and a... And would you say that those are very important? I swear yes. by this? Okay. Yeah.